been in a sermon series called Deeper Life, and we've been looking at how God has been inviting us to go deeper with him and in him. And we've been hearing different testimonies. And so this is our last Sunday in that series, Deeper Life. And so you're going to hear a little bit of my testimony. And I don't really have a whole lot, but I hope that it is that you hear the heart of the Father for you. And so let me go ahead and pray. Father God, I thank you so much for today. I thank you, Lord God, that you are ever present. I thank you that you are continuing to issue an invitation for us to come and be with you. And God, we don't have to travel far because the moment we look for you, we find you. You said that if we look for you with our whole heart, you will be found of us. And so God, today we we position ourselves. We are playing the easiest game of hide and go seek ever. Because we say, where are you? And you say, here I am. And so, Father, I thank you that you are here. God, we don't want anything else but to hear your voice, to see you, to meet with you, to feel you. So, Lord, would you answer that prayer? In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Um, I have a question for you. Raise your hand if you are the kind of person who can fall asleep anywhere. Standing up, on the ground, it doesn't matter. If they say good night before they turn off the light, you already out. I need some hands in the air. Who those people? Okay. I'm so jealous of y'all. <laughs> okay, raise your hand if you're the kind of person who has trouble turning off your mind to fall asleep. You are always thinking of what either happened or what's going to happen. And you could say, I'm going to bed, and an hour later, you're still awake. Yes. Yeah, that's, that's a lot of us in here. And then raise your hand if you have trouble staying asleep. You can go to sleep, but then you end up waking up in the middle of the night, and you can have trouble falling back to sleep. Is that anybody? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it doesn't matter if you got melatonin or whatever tonin in your system. It's like... 2.30 in the morning, here I am. 3 o'clock in the morning, here I am. <sighs> Y'all, one of the, I, you know, we can, we can um, some of us have spicy language, but one of the cuss words that I feel like is in the Bible. It's a four-letter word. It's in the Bible, and it's actually a command, but we treat it like it's a cuss word. Anybody know what that word is? Rest. 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 Anybody use that word lately? Yeah. Probably not. You avoid. You can say any other word that you want to, but I bet you avoid saying that word. You, <laughs> I'm about to rest. Nobody says, you know what? I'm just gonna go ahead and rest today. No, no. You avoid that. Somehow, rest gets out of our vocabulary, right? And then if somebody else said they rested, you'd be like, really? Well, good for you, right? But it's literally a commandment. Right up there with don't kill, don't steal, honor your mother and father is this commandment that says, take the Sabbath as holy, honor the Sabbath. And what is he saying? He's saying, look, six days you can do whatever you want to do, but I need you to give me 24 hours and rest. And we will, we will do everything but that, won't we? We'll give him, how long is service? We'll give him about 90 minutes, and then we'll be upset if it goes longer than 90. We'll be like, Lord, they had me in church all day. And the Lord's like, I wish they did. <laughs> I wish you would spend all day in my presence. So anyway, we're going to talk about rest today. The scripture I have for you is Esther chapter 6. It is this random little scripture. We're only going to read three verses. Y'all ready to read with me? Let's go ahead and stand up then because we know that participation is better than observation. We're not just going to observe today. We're going to participate. So we're going to read it together. And um, there are two, three, maybe three names that we might not recognize. The first one is Mordecai. The second one, I call him Big Santa. All right. Big Santa. And then we have Teresh. Okay. Mordecai, Big Santa, and Teresh. All right, here we go. Starting at verse one. That night, the king had trouble sleeping, so he ordered an attendant to bring the book of the history of his reign so it could be read to him. 
In those records, he discovered an account of how Mordecai had exposed the plot of Big Thana and Teresh, <laughs> two of the eunuchs who guarded the door to the king's private quarters. They had plotted to kill, to assassinate King Xerxes. What reward or recognition did we ever give Mordecai for this, the king asked. His attendants replied, nothing has been done for him. Awesome. You might have a seat. Good job reading, y'all. Readers are leaders. Good job. So in this text, we're in, the, we're in the book of Esther. And a lot of times when we read Esther, we just focus on Esther. But actually, this little bit of section is just about King Xerxes. He's a king of Persia, which at the time was one of the biggest empires in the world, the world had known at the time. And he could not sleep. He is one of those people who I laid down, but my mind won't turn off. And so what he decided to do was he said, you know, I'm going to pull out my journal and I'm going to read it. So he pulls out his records, the things that had happened in his life. And as he's reading his journal, he remembered the one who saved him. And so he asked the question, have I done anything lately for the one who saved me? And the answer was no. And the answer was no. I'm not even really going to get into the whole murder plot and stuff because that's not even the point. But it is in this moment of restlessness, he reflects. And then the question is, did I ever, the things that I was worried about didn't happen. The things I didn't even know to worry about didn't happen. Someone stepped in and interceded and saved me. And now, and I, I'm in a moment where I can't rest. And now I'm reflecting on that. And did I ever do anything for the one who saved me? I'm not sure how many of you journal or record your thoughts. I wish I was better at that. I wish I was better at, at journaling. I'm, I'm not good at it. It's hard for me to slow down enough to actually write because I think quicker than I write. And so then I'll do like half a bullet point and be like, I'm going to know what that means later. And you read it a couple years later, you're like, who? What? Right. I can't even read this handwriting. Like, what? <laughs> what is this? Is there anybody who actually they journal or they, or they write, record pretty often? Good job. I see a lot of counselors, too, with their hands up. You know, I went to therapy one time, and, um, and she was like, do you, do you journal? And I was like, why is this the question? Let's, let's talk. <laughs> why does my writing have to do? Anyway, wait a So anyway... But there's this moment of taking time, however you want to do it, whether it's, it's leaving um, video recordings or, you know, my mom does a lot with, um, what's it called, um, Marco Polo or whatever, or if it's recording yourself or however you want to do it, you should have some way that you reflect, that you're able to write down what's going on, record what's going on, so that later on, when you're in the midst of a restless season, you can go back and say, oh, but I remember when. I remember when the Lord saved me. I remember when I had prayed for that and I wanted it so bad. And he said no, and I didn't understand. And now I see that that actually wasn't the best plan. I had no idea. God, if I could go back over the different jobs or people or opportunities that I prayed for and just knew, trying to convince God, God, this is the right thing for me. Think about all that could happen if you give me this. And he didn't. And I'm like, I don't understand it. And I look back now and I'm like, I don't even remember those people. What would have happened? God, I didn't even see that this was another option. I thought it had to either be A or B. I didn't even know you had a, a J and a K and an L waiting in the wings. I didn't even know about them. I thought it happened, it had to happen at this particular time, and I had no idea that I wouldn't, I wouldn't have been ready for that. I would have wasted it. I would have squandered that moment. I would have squandered that opportunity. And so reflecting gives you an opportunity to go back and take a look, whether it's because you need to have confidence for what's happening in the future, or whether you just need to appreciate God for what he's done in the past already or see patterns in ourselves. And so it's like, oh, you know what? I had issues with this person. I had issues with that person. I had issues with this boss and that boss. Maybe it's not the bosses. 
maybe I don't like to be led. <laughs> and so, you know, uh, um, reflecting also helps you to kind of pull up those records of your own self and your own issues and say, oh, I, you know what, I thought I was over this, but maybe I'm not. Those, those things are still there. And so a lot of times we're not able to rest well because we don't reflect well. Our brains stay cranked up with worry and anxiety when we have forgotten the one who has saved us and what he has done for us already. We haven't really said thank you or appreciated him well. And so I just want you for a moment to take, to close your eyes and just take a moment and say, God, is there anything I have not thanked you for? Lord, is there any area where I have not appreciated you or have forgotten to say thank you? Hmm. Mm. Father, thank you. Thank you, Lord. So there's three things I want us to remember. One, God is God and not me. Oh, it's such a simple statement, but y'all, every day I be fighting for his throne. Every day I am fighting to be God in my life. But God is God and not me. Everything he makes is very good, and he is able to maintain it and sustain it, and I can trust my life and my time to him. I don't have to be in control. One of the, um, when I looked back over my journal, I told myself when I got married in October, I was like, I'm gonna, now I'm going to really keep this journal. I'm going to have a first year marriage journal. And as I was looking back at it this morning, I was like, I barely wrote one thing a month <laughs> in this. And I haven't written anything since June. I was like, oh my gosh. So then, you know, I had to try to write something real quick this morning. <laughs> um, but something happened in January. It was a rough... Um, it was a rough first couple months, not because of Joseph. Joseph is, uh, is amazing. It was a rough couple of months because I had just transitioned from Harrisonburg, a place I had lived for 12 years, to move down here where I didn't really know anybody. Um, I just got married. I just started a new job one week after getting married. And it was at a high school, I'm at, you know, Hopewell High School, but I hadn't been in an education setting for the past six years. And so part of me, you know, when you go into something new, you really only have something old to compare it to, right? So you're like, oh, okay, but the last time I taught was at this private Christian school, and I was able to relate with the kids well, and I was able to pray with them, and so it's going to be great. This was not, this is not a private Christian school, y'all. It's not. <laughs> I'm like, oh yeah, I taught history at that middle school, the private Christian school, and I'm gonna be in the history department this time. This is gonna be fine. Y'all, just getting up, I had never had to do a 30 minute commute before. All right, Harrisonburg, everything is what? How? 12 at the max. That's if you hit every light, it takes 12 minutes to get anywhere. And so a 30 minute commute, by the time I got to work, I was tired and ready to go back home. I was like, what is you want me to do something now? Like, and then I had not been, I, like I said, I've been in Harrisonburg for 12 years. I've been a part of our church up there for 12 years. I've been working at the church for the past six. It had been a long time. I didn't realize it. it's been a long time since I entered into a place where I didn't know anybody and no one knew me. And I wasn't expecting how lonely that felt. So, the, one of the first days or whatever, they would call me because my um, ID hadn't gotten changed. So they were still calling me Miss Harper. And I'm like, no, it's Boykin. <laughs> it's Boykin. But um, one day I, got, I started November 1st. And one of, the co my, one of my coworkers had said, what are you going to do for Thanksgiving? And I was like, well, my husband and I, because <laughs> I, hadn't, I hadn't said that, you know, very often. I just got married. <laughs> and like, literally, I just started laughing. And I was like, my husband and I, <laughs> and she's like, So what are y'all going to do? And I got so embarrassed because I'm like, oh, if I was in Harrisonburg, the moment I said that, they would have been like, girl, your husband, you know what I mean? Because they knew how long, how, how long I had waited to, got, to get married. They knew the journey. And now I'm in a place where nobody knows me and they don't know my journey either. And so the things that I'm giggling over, celebrating or feeling frustrated with, they're just like, that's your life. And it was lonely. 
And then I was having all these physical issues and um, my skin was having uh, certain things happening and I, I got like skin stuff now and all this stuff. And so in January, I'm writing in that journal and I'm like, Lord, what is going on? And God said to me, he said, will you keep wrestling for control or will you submit? And I'm telling you, it was one of those things where I'm like, this is not the answer I was looking for, Lord. (laughs) I was looking for a word of deliverance. I was looking for a word of power. I was looking for like a, you know what? It's okay to quit. It's okay to let that go. You know, Amir keeps offering you to come up to me. Go ahead and go. Like, (laughs) you know what I mean? And... I was not, I was looking for something else and the Lord was like, actually, I'm inviting you deeper so that you can, you're starting to see weeds that you didn't notice before. And now will you pull those weeds up or will you let them continue to grow and choke out the life that I've given you? Choke out the fruit that you're supposed to have. Control is a weed, y'all. And I know sometimes we're feeling like perfectionism is helpful because it's making sure I get everything done and I have meet this standard or whatever. He said, but who created the standard? You made that. And now you're anxious whenever you can't get to the standard that you created. He said, I never told you to get there. You're not loving well because you're trying to be in control. So now if somebody, if Joseph doesn't do what I asked him to do or do it on the time that I, you're not going to wash, I'll just wash the dishes myself. And, I, and it's like, what in the world? You don't love well when you're trying to be in control. You're definitely not showing the fruit of the spirit. Are you patient? Do you have joy? Are you gentle? Are you long suffering? When you're, no. Because control is you trying to hold something tightly to make sure it doesn't fall apart. And the Lord said, but you were never the one who was supposed to control it in the first place. As as kids, we sing, he's got the whole world in his hands. And we be trying to keep our whole world in our hands. And let me tell you, our hands aren't big enough. And so things break up, things fall apart. And we're trying to pick up every little piece. And we're like, God, what's going on? And he's like, because you weren't supposed to hold it in the first place. So will you submit or will you keep wrestling for control? And so things to remember, God is God, not me. And until I keep that in proper perspective, I was going to keep trying to wrestle control out of his hands. The second thing, I was created to be me, not to do everything myself. And I know that sounds just like the first one, but it's, it's slightly different. I was created to be me, not to do everything. <sighs> Someone prophesied over my life and they were like, I really feel like the Lord just calling you to be in this season. And I was like, how do I do be? So what do I do to be? Because I have a very strong performance mentality. I'm the oldest of four. I have three younger brothers and our household was very, to me, very competitive. If I got an A, my brothers are trying to get an A. If they, were, if they were able to get, you know, whatever award, I wanted to make sure that I had an award to bring home. We're, it was very competitive. Competition is not always bad, but competition, when you're not understanding that what you do is not the, the entirety of who you are, that is, that's, that's where it gets skewed up, right? Because, I mean, I'm not an athlete, but I'm sure there are people who, are, if you are an athlete for this amount of time and then you stop doing the sport, there's that time where you start asking yourself, so who am I without this? And that's without even athletics. That could be anything, right? This question of who am I without this? When I left Harrisonburg and moved here and I, stopped, and I wasn't working at the church full time in Harrisonburg, it was who am I without this? Who am I now? And so the person told me, I think God would just want you to be in this season. And I'm like, be what? Because it's not like I'm being unemployed. Like, what? be what? <laughs> you know? And so, and so then we try to find another label. Well, let me be a wife. I want to be a good wife. And I found myself trying to perform in that, right? So it's like, I need to make sure I cook dinner every night. And y'all, there was this one moment, because I ain't cooked before. Listen. <laughs> Let me tell you, and the people, the people who are my friends know this. 
You can count on one hand how many times I had cooked the year leading up to marriage, okay? He didn't marry me because of my cooking. I can cook, but I just wasn't doing it. It was a choice. And so, <laughs> and so it was like, okay, I want to be a good wife. But again, that standard was my own thought of what a good wife meant. So for us, you can say I'm going to be a good employee, good student, good whatever, good daughter, good son. I'm going to be a good friend. I'm going to be a good Christian. What does that mean? When you put good in front of it, what does that mean? The moment you put good in front of it, it means that you've now created your own definition. Because my mom is here. I am her daughter. Point blank. She can't deny it, y'all. She looks just like me. (laughs) Anyway. Uh, (laughs) She can't deny it. I am her daughter. But when I say I want to be a good daughter, did she put that label on or did I say that? I said that, which means that I now need to decide what good means, right? So I could say a good daughter makes sure that my mom never has to wash a, day, uh, wash a load of laundry again a day in her life. And she's like, I never said that you had to come do my laundry. So then when I'm all anxious, like, oh, my gosh, I'm gonna, oh, I need to go and make sure I get her laundry done. And I need to drive up to Fredericksburg and make sure I, and oh, my, your laundry's not ready. Why don't you have the clothes ready? I'm trying to be a good daughter. And she's like, who asked you to do that? You are driving yourself crazy, running yourself ragged over a definition that she never asked for. So when we say, I want to be a good Christian, and God is saying, who, Jesus said, who is good (laughs) but the Father? What definition of goodness are you trying to put before whatever he's already called you? So he already called you a son or a daughter. And even when Jesus got baptized, The heavens open and God said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased, right? And Jesus didn't say before that, well, let me be a good son and try to get baptized. It's like, no, God's pleasure is on me. Period. And it's so hard for me to believe that because of just this performance mindset that I have to do something to be affirmed. I have to do something to be loved. I have to do something to be respected. And he's saying, no, 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 no. Be. So I am created to be me, not do everything myself. And I can become uh, diligently obsessive about the wrong things. When we become obsessed about something, y'all, when we become fanatics about something, the Bible uses this word called zeal. Anybody heard that word before? When you're zealous about something. It means that you are... It can mean that you are passionate, but it's not just that you're passionate, but it's passion in action. Paul is a great example of this. Paul in the Bible, he was zealous for the Jewish tradition. Notice I did not say he was zealous for God. He was zealous for the Jewish tradition. So then when these believers started showing up talking about Jesus as the Messiah, he's like, that goes against the Jewish tradition. So what am I going to do in my zeal? I will wipe them out. He was zealous, but for the wrong thing. Because if he had been zealous for God, when something came up that said it was from God and it didn't look familiar, he would say, well, Lord, let me seek you. And then you will tell me if this is of you. But because he was zealous for tradition, it was like, no, 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 this comes up against tradition. So I will kill everybody who's a Christian which is what he did. And then he had to have a come to Jesus moment. And then he took that same zealousness and he redirected in the right place. Well, I realized, man, I was doing a lot for God, but I wasn't being zealous to come to God. You can be zealous to serve the Lord, but still not have a relationship with him. And so in um, our last scripture for today is Hebrews chapter 4. And um, we're going to do, yes, verse 11. Thank you. So Hebrews chapter 4 is talking about the background story. He's talking to, the, uh, the author is talking to Jewish believers. And so he's bringing up things from the Old Testament. And one of the things in the Old Testament was how the children of Israel had to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. They were 
they were told there is this land of promise, but they kept disobeying God. And so that kept delaying them walking into their promise. That is a whole thing right there, y'all. Disobedience will delay the promise that God has for you. But the author is saying, look, we're not going to try to do what they did. We're not going to spend 40 years and never get it. Instead, he says in verse 11, let us do our best to enter that rest, to enter that rest, that promise of rest. But if we disobey God as the, peop- as the people of Israel did, we will fall. So this, in the New Tra- Living Translation, it says, let's do our best. In the King James and some other translations, it says, let's be zealous. Let us strive. Let us put passion and action to enter that rest. It is not just, well, you know what, Lord, today, if I get a chance to rest with you, if I get a chance to be with you, then I'll do it. God, today, if something opens up in my, in my schedule, then yes, I'll do quiet time. Today, if, if I end up running late or if I get there early, then I'll spend time with, no, zealousness says I'm putting everything else on the back burner until I meet with God. Zealousness is saying, God, I am jealous for my time with you. And anything that interrupts my time with you, I'm upset at that until I have my time with you, right? And so there is this, there is this, um, this time where I realized I was zealous, but for the wrong things. And it showed up and I was judgmental because I'm like, I'm here at the church every day. Yo, you're not at church. Oh, I guess you don't love God the way I love God. I didn't say it out loud. But inside, I had become judgmental. And then I became resentful because I was working all the time for the Lord, right? And so then I'm looking at other people who are walking in their freedom, walking and looking all rested. (laughs) Talking about, yeah, I just feel like the Lord just put me in a season of rest. And so I'm just not saying, I'm just saying no to some things. And I'm like, (sighs) part of me is like, we can do that. But the other part is like, oh, you must not be heathen. You know what I mean? Because I was zealous for the wrong thing. And there was a part of me that was like, but if I don't do these things for God, who am I? But then also, if I don't do these things for God, will he love me? Am I valuable to him? Because my value is only in what I do for God, right? Right? He made me to use me, right? And he's like, no, I made you to love you. When you get to heaven, he had to say this to me. When you get to heaven, what will you be doing for me? What will you be doing for me for the rest of eternity? I don't need you to pave my streets with gold. I don't need you to build me mansions in heaven. You will not be trying to figure out how to organize the angels. You will be resting in me, worshiping me. So then why wouldn't your life here reflect where you're going? It's that whole practice before you play, right? I love how I keep using athletic analogies, even though whatever. So, (laughs) But it's like, if you're thinking that you're going to just be able to get out on the court and just do it, that's a lie. He's like, if you think you could get to eternity and now be able to rest, no. Y'all, have you ever taken a vacation? And the first few days of vacation, you don't even know what to do with yourself because you're so used to going. I was talking, oh, who was I talking to? I was talking to somebody and I was like, did you sleep in? And they were like, yeah, I woke up about like 6.50. And I was like, "That that is not sleeping in. Retrain your body to sleep in. (laughs) But that's the thing. You've got to retrain your, you have to train your body to rest. Because your body is so used to carrying stress that it takes, usually if you take a week off, it takes about three days before your body begins to relax enough to actually let go of the stress. And so for some of us who only take three-day vacations, that's why you come back and you're like, I don't feel like I, I rested at all. Because your body never actually, the dopamine never actually calmed down. So let us be zealous about the right things. Let's be passionate about what God is passionate about. And then the third thing, worship my creator. I was created to worship and I will worship something if I'm not careful to keep my eyes on him. My biggest idol is often me. Because I'm always thinking about what makes me happy 
What are my preferences? What are my desires? I want my way. It's my life, my time, my money, and I want it now. That is my biggest idol. And if we're honest, that's probably your biggest idol as well. And so if we do not choose to worship God, we will inevitably worship something else. And so the next 21 days, starting tomorrow, not today, but tomorrow, because <laughs> I got some Doritos I got to finish up, but starting tomorrow, and a slice of carrot cake waiting for me, but starting tomorrow, we're not just doing a 21-day fast, we're doing a 21-day reset. We're really, we're really taking the next 21 days and saying, Lord, I want to reset my worship back to you. And y'all, it is not going to be easy because the same way we just talked about how it takes your body time to really adjust to rest. It also takes our minds and our souls time to adjust to worship. I think we assume if we just put on a song, we're worshiping. But you and I both know we could put that song on and our mind is far away from that song. We still thinking about any, uh, whatever we got on our to-do list. We're still thinking about grudges. We still, our emotions, whatever. And then it's like, oh, the song went off. Okay, let me think of my next song. What am I going to put on next so I can keep worshiping? You're not worshiping God. You might be worshiping something else though. But this next 21 days, I don't want it to just be how can we cut out something. But it's also what do I need to add, Lord, to be with you? Because it's not just about what we're doing for the next 21 days, but what are we, who are we becoming? And I have this bookmark that um, someone gave me. Oh, I think it's my other notebook. But, and it said, Lord, you are with me as I become. And I just thought that was so beautiful. Because I'm like, I don't know how to be. I don't know how to do be. But God, I do know that you're with me. And that every situation that you allow me to be in this, in, in this life, it is so I can become all that you have for me to be. So in this next 21 days, yes, we're going to be cutting out something. For some of us, we're going to say, we're not doing any, we're going to do the Daniel fast. We're not going to do any processed foods, no dairy, no meat, no sweets. Fruits and vegetables. That's what he, that's for some of us. For others of us. <laughs> we might say, you know what? From the hours of 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., I'm not going to eat. And instead, I'm going to eat at, after 6. But I'm not going to eat from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. For others, it might be that you're doing no meats, no sweets. And so you just simplify that. And so you're not, no meats, no sweets. But whatever it is that you're saying, this is the dividing line. This is what I'm going to do. The other thing that you need to say is, now who am I going to be during these 21 days? Because you can be grumpy, grouchy, and hungry. All 21 days. And the people around you were like, you know what? Give God that chicken. Because I need you to go ahead and get back to your normal self. Or <laughs> you can say, Lord, this might be a rough couple days. I might have a rough few hours. But I'm going to be more committed to you. I'm going to make sure that what I listen to aligns with your word. And so this might also be a really good time to say, you know what, I'm going to do a Christian music ch um, challenge too. And then I'm just going to be playing Christian music this whole time because I don't need anything else that's going to stir up my flesh. Because if I'm already saying no to something, it's going to be so much easier to say yes to something that I'm not supposed to over here. Because we could be like, well, I'm doing good here. But you know what, I can, I can say yes over, no, 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 no. Don't try to justify it. So God, I want to maybe change my music. But Lord, more than that, I want to change my, the way I schedule my time. Do I need to wake up a little earlier? Or do I, during the lunchtime, since, you know, since I'm not eating like I used to anyway, let me go ahead and open up that word. What's my verse of the day? What chapters am I reading? How can I be praying for somebody else? Not just for yourself, but for somebody else. Jesus told his disciples, he had this great conversation with the woman at the well. 
And the disciples weren't there because they went to go get him something to eat. And when they came back, the woman had left. And when they came back, Jesus said, they were like, are you hungry? And Jesus was like, no, my, fo- my food is to do the will of the Father. That's what I eat. I eat God's will. <laughs> that, y'all, that's churchy right there, but that's Jesus. And, and so they were like, did somebody bring him food? <laughs> and he's like, no, I'm actually full because I know I was obedient to do what God told me to do. Y'all, I want to live my life in such a way where literally I can be like, Lord, I wasn't even thinking about food today because I know I was doing what you called me to do. I wasn't even thinking about what I can't have because I was focused on what I can have, and that's more of you. It could be so hard, and you know this if you ever work, you know, work with like toddlers. It could be so hard to, to get them to stop focusing on the thing that, but I want, but I, and it's like, no, come, but look, I have more for you than just this one thing that you want. This next 21 days, I promise you what the Lord is saying is I have more for you than just what you think you want right now. It's going to start with a desire to actually rest in him, y'all. And I know we might say, yes, I want rest. Most of us wouldn't say, you know, no to that. But resting in him may look like letting go of control, letting go of performance. It may look like letting go of my my self-worship to actually say yes to the God who continues to invite me into his grace. He loves you. He saved you. And he has more in store for you than you can, your, your mind can even comprehend. Nothing we have done makes us deserve or earn his love, nor can we do anything to change how he feels about us. And we can rest in that. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much that God, you are inviting us into rest over these next 21 days. God, it's an active rest, which, you know, that can sound so confusing because it's like, how am I resting and still doing? Should I take off work? Can I, can I take off work? <laughs> but Lord, you're saying, actually, I want you to walk in what I've called you to do. But rather than relying on your strength, I want you to rely on mine, says the Lord. You will feel weak. You will feel weak this week. Whether it's in your body or in your emotions or in your mind, you will feel weak. But he said, that's okay. Because in your weakness is what I am made strong. You will see my strength this week if you will actually rest in me. So, God, we take you up on that. I thank you, Lord God, that we won't operate in fear. But, God, we will operate in faith that you always show up. In Jesus' name, I pray.